Alrighty, the first set of notes for Unit 8, long overdue. Let's see how quickly we can get through these. They're a little long. So we're going to talk about how organisms respond to their environment. So organisms can respond to environmental changes in multiple ways. There's several behavioral mechanisms we're going to look at as well as, as, well as physiological ones. First thing we've got to do, though, is establish our terminology. So a stimulus is any change in the environment, whether it's internal or external. And then the response is the reaction that an organism has to that change. So what we see here is a plant that is growing, and it is not growing directly towards the sun originally. Uh, so it responds to that by changing its direction of growth so that it is now pointing towards the sun, so that way it can get as much light exposure as possible possible and perform as much photosynthesis as possible. Um, that response is called phototropism. You may have noticed it if you're growing some plants yourselves, that they tend to grow towards the light. This is a response that plants have to maximize their sugar production during photosynthesis. When, when they produce more food, they will increase their survival chances. It's mediated by a hormone called auxin, which basically causes cells on the dark side of the plant to grow longer. And when they grow longer, that forces the plant to bend towards the sun. There is another set of stimulus and response um, sort of interactions, which has to do with the timing of whether uh, day, uh, the daytime or the amount of hours of day are short or whether the amount of hours of daylight are long. So you have some short day plants that whenever they have uh, shorter days, so whenever the nights become longer, they will bloom. Um, and then you have some long day plants that will bloom up until the point where night exceeds a certain length. Um, and this helps plants respond to changes in seasons. So plants need to bloom when um, they'll lay seeds that will have ideal growing conditions. They also need to bloom when their pollinators are active. And so what can happen is they'll time their blooming based on the length of the day, and that will ensure that their reproduction will happen when growing conditions are ideal. You can also look at movement in animals or fungi or unicellular organisms. There are a couple of terms we use here. So taxis is movement towards or away from a stimulus, and usually it will involve some sort of prefix. So you have chemotaxis, moving towards or away from a chemical. Um, you can have uh, probably halotaxis, moving towards or away from salty conditions. And then you can put the word positive or negative in front of it. If you're talking about positive chemotaxis, that means that an organism is attracted to a specific chemical. And this happens mostly in organisms that are motile. Motile means they are capable of movement. Now, most fungi aren't capable of getting up and physically moving them whole, their whole selves towards something, but they can grow towards something. There are, though, some slime molds that can actually move around. Um, kinesis is usually the change in the rate of movement, but um, or it's non-directional, but it's not necessarily towards or away from something. It's a little bit random. So as you see in the um, in the kind of pill bug example at the top, that bug is just wandering around randomly, and it wanders around randomly until it hits something ideal, which is a nice moist shaded site that it can live in. This fish in the bottom is exhibiting positive taxis, which means it's moving towards something. And the Rio part uh, basically refers to the current of the river. So this positive Rio taxis means that the, the trout is always swimming upstream. So that way, hopefully food will come towards it and, you know, just pop into its mouth. Uh, all organisms have some sort of circadian rhythm, which is the natural sleep-wake cycle, or if you're talking about other organisms, active-inactive cycle. Uh, this is regulated by light cues, although most organisms have an innate or internal circadian rhythm, which you can see if you track the activity of an organism when you put them in complete darkness or complete light. They've actually done experiments like that with humans as well as with animals. How can you track that? Well, there's something called an actogram. It has shown up on an AP test before. No guarantee it'll show up again, 
but it's still an interesting graph to look at. Basically, each of these, this bar represents a light cycle, usually 12 hours of light, and then this represents a dark part of the cycle, once again, usually 12 hours. And so what you see is this organism, whatever they are, um, these bars, a lot of these actograms tend to be with mice, and these bars represent basically times of activity, usually measured by having some sort of um, device that the, the mouse can interact with, in most cases like a wheel. And so when you have a wheel in a cage with the mouse, it'll spend most of its active time on there. You'll notice that there is a very little activity when there's daylight or when there's the light part of this cycle. However, during the dark periods of the cycle, there is a high level of activity. So this will let you know that this organism is most active at night. Um, and you know if you start uh, letting this organism live in complete darkness, then what you can see is does it have a natural circadian rhythm, which it will, and what is the length of that circadian rhythm? It's not always a full 24 hours. It's usually a little less or a little more. It's a little off. And then um, basically the organism will, if its sleep-wake cycle gets offset, usually some input from the eyes of, of when it sees light will reset the circadian rhythm. Humans have a circadian rhythm as well. Uh, it's um, going to be kind of general like this one that diagram that's on here but some people probably have slightly different rhythms um and so uh you can kind of see that some of these these um these uh body conditions will change so for example there's a time during which you have a minimal body temperature where if you were measuring someone's temperature constantly that would be the lowest another time where their body temperature would be at its maximum etc but just be aware that you'll see diagrams like this potentially, or you'll see some sort of um, question involving it. Um, a seasonal type of change that is found in animals is either hibernation or estivation. Hibernation is probably something familiar to. It's when an organism basically, we think of it as going to sleep, but it's actually entering a, a state that's beyond sleep, uh, where it's dormant and it's saving as much energy as possible. This happens usually during lean winter months when it's cold and there's very few resources to increase the chance of survival. Very common example is, you know, uh, a bear. Though this is some sort of shrew, I believe. Then estivation is actually kind of the opposite. Animals enter a state of dormancy, not when it's cold, but when it's really hot or when it's really dry. So if you have organisms that live in a very hot and dry environment, they may go into estivation during the summer months or during the dry season, so they can reduce the amount of resources that they need to use, and therefore they increase their chance of survival. And there are environmental cues for this, like the length of the day and everything. So organisms can be divided into multiple categories depending on when they're active and when they rest. Uh, you're most familiar probably with nocturnal and diurnal organisms. There are organisms that keep to other schedules, but we're not going to go into them. So the organisms that are active at night are nocturnal. I generally tend to people tell people I'm nocturnal because I gen generally tend to be most active at night, but technically humans are diurnal. All right, so if you are nocturnal, you're going to have a set of adaptations that are going to allow you to operate best in the darkness. So they usually have highly developed senses of things like hearing or smell, and if they rely on eyesight, they're going to have special adaptions to their eyes. Adaptations, sorry. That's supposed to be adaptation. Like this little fellow right here has ginormous eyeballs. That is an indication that they are probably a nocturnal organism because their eyes are as big as possible to let in as much light as possible. Um, and then their cornea is also bigger to capture more light. Another thing is that they will have, if they are nocturnal, a lot more rod cells. So here what you're seeing is you see a little, basically a little hill for a cone cell and a, a little rectangle for a rod cell. Notice there are much more rectangles in the nocturnal animals. That's because rod cells are sensitive to low light, so they can operate fairly well in low light condition. They're just not sensitive to color, so that's why organisms that are nocturnal may not have a sensitive color vision. I mean, if you think about it, in the night, things don't really tend to show off a lot of color.
There are some advantages to being nocturnal. You can avoid predators. You can avoid competition with diurnal species that live in your same habitat. And then if you live in a desert-like or a very hot or very dry ecosystem, if you are mostly awake at night when the temperatures are cooler, you'll lose less water because water is a very important resource in those uh, ecosystems. Uh, now, this is not quite a nocturnal adaptation. Technically, the ones that are being uh, shown here are cat eyes, and cats are not technically nocturnal. I know they seem nocturnal, but they're actually what's called crepuscular, uh, which means they're most active at dawn and at dusk. So when it's turning tonight and when it's you know, turning today. They have this shiny layer on the back of their eye called the tapetum lucidum. And the tapetum lucidum, its job is to just reflect. So it reflects light that it receives back up to the retina, as you see right here. So if this is the retinal layer, the tapetum lucidum is going to reflect light back onto the retina. So even if you're getting half the light, your tapetum lucidum would help you catch extra light. This is also why if you look at a cat or a dog or various animals' uh, eyes in the darkness, they seem to glow at you. Actually, I don't think dogs glow. I don't know. I know cat's eyes glow because I have plenty of pictures of my cats as little demon kitties. But um, this is an adaptation to help them see better under low light conditions. Diurnal organisms are active during the day and rest at night, and many organisms that are diurnal are going to have well-developed color vision. Uh, therefore, they're going to have a lot of cone cells and less rod cells. Uh, there are some advantages to being diurnal. For example, you lose less energy to maintain your body temperature active. If you are going to be active physically moving around and maintaining body temperature, um, then that's a little easier to do during the day than at night when it tends to be colder and you have to basically burn more energy in order to keep your body temperature higher. So it can help with um, energy efficiency. So organisms can exchange information um, and they can even uh, exchange information between different species. So here are a few different examples. The fight or flight response um, is uh, something that you can see anytime you startle an animal or a person. Um, and with that, uh, an animal will usually release some type of hormone like adrenaline when it's under threat or perceives a threat. And that will prepare the body to either flee from or fight off whatever danger is present. Um, this also results in some characteristic changes. So in mammals, Fur tends to puff up to try to make the animal look larger. Uh, and then these animals may also take on characteristic attack postures as a warning. Like, if you're going to mess with me, I will fight you off. Uh, then there are what are called predator warnings or aposomatic warnings. Uh, this is often a color signal that lets predators know, I taste really bad or I will kill you if you eat me because I'm toxic or I'm poisonous. Um, and so that usually serves as a warning to predators. Yeah, don't, don't eat that really bright colored frog. They're probably going to kill you if you do. And then plants are usually thought of as being really passive. Okay, something's going to come along and eat them and they're not going to really be able to do anything. But it turns out uh, plants have a response to being nibbled on. So let's say we have this caterpillar sitting here eating this plant. Well, the plant will then, once it's um, got damaged tissue here, it will actually have this signaling molecule that it will release, which then triggers the leaves to release something volatile. And volatile means basically, volatile, that it turns to gas. So it'll then float through the air, diffuse through the air, and what it does is it attracts parasitic insects that will then do something that will end up killing off the herbivore. So plants may not be able to move, but if something's trying to eat them, they can be like, oh, you want to eat me? I'll find something that eats you and invite it to dinner. And therefore, they can protect themselves from some of this, this herbivore activity. By the way, here are a bunch of examples of a aposematic uh, coloring. These guys are all brightly colored, and that indicates that they are dangerous. Or in the case of this butterfly, maybe not dangerous, but maybe just really bitter or nasty tasting. 
what happens is predators either may have an extinct instinctive aversion to these brightly colored prey or you know uh you know it may have like chomped on a butterfly that really tasted nasty at one point and learned okay whatever looks like that don't eat it because it's utterly disgusting. In some cases, this uh, coloring can be an indication of toxicity. Like, I think this is a coral snake. This is a poisonous uh, frog. This is, I think, if I remember correctly, a flatworm. And it is venomous or toxic. And here is an insect that looks kind of like a bee and an ant had a homicidal baby. And I'm sure it stings. So if you see anything that brightly colored, don't touch it. It's going to kill you. All right. So the behavioral responses that organisms have can affect the fitness of an organism and help it contribute to the success of a population. So here are some examples where organisms can do that. Organisms can not only act on the information and formulate a response to whatever stimulus they encounter, but they can also communicate that to others. So animals do a lot of this with either chemical signaling like pheromones or something audible like bird songs. They may also put up some sort of visual signal. Plants we are finding more and more can actually communicate with each other in really complicated ways that we're only just starting to realize. Um, so a lot of that is either through these volatile organic compounds or VOCs or through fungal networks that interconnect their roots. So here what we're seeing is a fungal system interconnecting the roots of two plants. Uh, this guy has some sort of uh, herbivorous animal like aphids on it. Um, it communicates that through the mycorrhizal fungal network, usually through some sort of chemicals, which then are received by the roots of this other plant, which can then produce chemicals which will block the aphids. And it's literally like it's telling its neighbor, hey, there are aphids around. Don't let them eat you. Pheromones are chemicals that are used by mostly animals to uh, trigger some sort of specific behavioral response. Um, and it can be in mother in, uh, members of the same species usually. It can also be amongst members of different species, but we're mostly focusing on within a species. So for example, a bee controls, uh, a queen bee controls quite a bit of what happens in the hive with a number of pheromones. Depending on the pheromones it releases, that will prevent eggs from developing into other queens. Um, it will also help and um, choose like, uh, you know, what's gonna happen with the, uh, the other, the worker drones that are produced. So for example, inhibit aggression towards the queen like, hey, you're all my worker bees and you're all doing everything to, you know, help raise my children and help them survive. Please don't kill me. You outnumber me quite a bit. Uh, then in mammals, you can have a lot of the use of pheromones to attract a mate. Uh, communicates quite a bit of uh, information. So, for example, um, here these pheromones... Um, might be to help avoid inbreeding. So organisms might be able to tell from the pheromones or scents released that, okay, that male is too closely related. No interbreeding there. Um, and then the male can release some pheromones that then trigger things like um, estrus synchronization or accelerating puberty and basically make the female more receptive to mating and producing offspring. Now, there are multiple ways that these various kinds of communication happen. Uh, so there are a number of different signaling behaviors we'll talk about. Signaling behavior is anything designed to change behavior in other organisms. So here's an example for you. When we look at a flower, like say this dandelion here, we see something very boring, just yellow flower petals. Okay, big deal. But if you look at it under UV light, like what you see on the left hand side, it looks quite different. It's almost like it's pointing a target on the center, like come over here, there's some nectar for you to eat. And this may not seem very interesting until you learn that some insects can see UV light. So the ones that can see you in UV light can then be directed directly to their nectar source where they can pick up pollen. And then when they go to the next flower, they'll pollinate that flower. Um, and so the plants are like, hey, I need you to come pollinate me. Uh, here's some stuff for you to take. Uh, here's some nectar. Come on over here. I'll point an arrow towards where it is. It's right here. You can see some really interesting patterns when you look at 
uh, flowers under UV light. So for example, this guy right here, and I'm not great with flowers, so I don't know what that is. Almost looks like a daisy, but uh, like I said, I don't know. Um, it's got this different coloring in the center as if to say, hey, go take the nectar. Grab my pollen. Come on, man. I ain't paying you to sit around. Uh, animals use a number of different types of signals to communicate. So they can use visual ones, audible ones, tactile ones, electrical and chemical, electrical and chemical. And we're going to look at some examples of each of these. So they can use these traits to try to indicate dominance for one thing. So for example, this visual cue right here is a Gila monster and those bright orange stripes are indicating dominance so that if other males come to its territory or in its population, it can be like, you don't want to mess with me. I got the orange. Uh, this tactile uh, expression of dominance is basically two male snakes wrestling. And when one of them is defeated, it, you know, it'll lose out on a dominant position. Here we have another visual signal, which also probably includes a bit of an auditory signal, which is this nice, happy gorilla beating its chest, like I am the dominant one here, go away. Um, here we have a type of fish, I forget the name off the top of my head, but basically it sends out electrical signals to stimu simulate, uh, to basically say, I'm dominant, back off. Uh, and then you have multiple auditory signals. So here, for example, is the sound of an elephant seal. So, if you were an elephant seal and you heard that noise, I would tell you, back off, because that elephant seal is probably about to attack you. Um, they can also communicate to find food, so uh, in multiple ways. So there's chemical signaling, which ants do very well. If an ant finds a food source, it will basically leave a pheromone trail as it makes its way back to the nest. And then other ants that are leaving the nest to go search for food will follow that pheromone trail and start bringing that food back home. Uh, here we have a kind of tactile and also a little visual uh, signal of communication. It's the famous bee waggle dance. Basically, depending on how fast they waggle, uh, the direction that they're moving when they do this, it indicates where there's a food source. And it indicates some really specific directions. Like, go that way, that angle from the sun, uh, from where the sun is right now, for about this much Direct, uh, this much time or this much distance and uh, I'm waggling a lot so there's a lot of food there so everybody go um, and then one thing I did not know was ravens can actually make a sound to try to uh, to tell or other ravens hey there's food here so let's see if I can get this to play looks like that one's not gonna play sorry guys Ask me to play it during class if you if you want to, um, but it, it's basically their their noise that sounds kind of like ha ha ha. Sounds almost kind of like a creepy laugh. That's a raven signaling other ravens there's food nearby. They can also establish territory um, in various means. So here is a visual signal that is left by a lynx in Belarus. And it's basically clawing the trees to let you know, hey, this is my territory. It's also a bit of a chemical signal because cats have, a lot of cat species have scent glands in their, in their claws or in their paws. And so when they scratch at a tree, they're leaving scent markings behind. And that's actually what this bear is doing. He is rubbing against that tree to mark that this is his territory. So if you come here, I will fight you. That's what this uh, King Julian style ring-tailed lemur is doing. Uh, it has scent glands near its butt. And so it just goes around rubbing its butt on things, which gets its territorial scent everywhere. Um, a very common thing that I just really didn't want to put a picture of is that a lot of organisms will establish their territory, a lot of animals, by peeing, uh, by basically urinating or defecating, and leaving those as clear scent and sight markers that this is their territory. And then we have an auditory signal as well. <laughs> how to communicate with each other. They also how to indicate to other maybe lone wolves in the area, this is my territory, back off. Um, 
Animals can also communicate in various means to ensure reproductive success. So here I mostly have visual and auditory signals. Uh, let's talk about the visual ones first. This is a cuttlefish and cuttlefish are related to octopuses and squid and they have that interesting um, technique where they can change the color and the pattern of the coloration on their skin. So they will use that in mating displays to try and att attract a mate. That's very similar to what this lightning bug is doing. Uh, different lightning bugs, the lightning bug species will blink their, their, basically their butts, they'll blink their lights in specific patterns and that will attract members of the same species. If one of these unfortunate ladies, I think it's the ladies that blink, or is it the fellas? I forget. Um, if one of the unfortunate lightning bugs happens to blink in a pattern that's slightly off from the rest of its species, no other member of its species would recognize it as something or someone to mate with. Here we have one of my favorite spiders on the planet. This is the peacock spider. The peacock spider does this crazy little waggling dance with its colorful little butt flap, waving some legs in the air, and that's how it works to attract a mate. Um, if you guys have seen the Planet Earth series, you've probably seen this guy. This is a bird of paradise, and it does this visual dance that would, quite frankly, creep me out if I was a female bird, but, you know, uh, to try and court females of its species. Um, and the sound it makes almost sounds like a typewriter, if you've ever heard that sound. Then there are multiple auditory mating calls, which apparently decided not to work. I had a frog, and I had a song, a songbird. Okay. That's just, that's depressing. Sorry, guys. So natural selection favors behaviors that increase survival and reproductive success. There are multiple types of those behaviors, though. There's innate behaviors and there's learned behaviors. So let's talk about innate behaviors first. These are usually genetically hardwired. These do not have to be learned. Um, and so there'll be some sort of physical action or response that happens to some cue and an organism doesn't have to learn this. They'll just do it automatically. Um, and so this is like biological determinism. You have a behavior that's coded for in your genes. You don't need to learn it. Uh, this is in the form of what we call fixed action patterns, which are these innate behaviors that happen spontaneously and they really, really are hard to break. Like you may not be able to keep an animal from acting out a fixed action pattern based on a cue. So for example, here we see a goose, basically if one of its eggs rolls away, it will get up, approach the egg, and then basically push the, the egg back to its nest. If you place something egg-shaped near its nest, a goose will still do this, even though it's not one of their eggs. It's just they see the right shape, size, stimulus, and they are just going to go over and push, it the, push that into their nest. Another thing is um, these male stickleback fish, during mating season, the bottom of their bodies is red and they become very aggressive towards anything else with red on its bottom. So scientists were trying to figure out what is it that, that um, indicates, okay, uh, I need to be aggressive. So they tried a few different things. They put a realistic uncolored model of a stickleback. None of the, uh, none of the males attacked it. They were like, nah, I don't care. Then they started putting things that don't even really look like fish, but that had red on their undersides and the fish would attack them. It turns out the color and the placement of that color would set off this fixed action pattern that, oh, I see red on the bottom. I need to go chase that male away from my territory or my ladies. Another set of um, innate interactions are parent offspring interactions. So, uh, you know, when a baby is born, when a, a chick hatches when uh you know in here a uh, horse is fold uh it's got to be able to carry out certain behaviors without having to learn them especially those that are uh, associated with either forming a bond with their mother or getting food from their parent so herring gulls which are these guys right here have this red spot on the bottom of their beak at least the adults do herring gull chicks instinctively peck at this red dot and that induces their parent to vomit up food for the chick or regurgitate it. And so that's how they get food. Any herring gold chicks that don't do this 
don't get fed necessarily, or they might not get fed as often. So scientists were testing out, once again, what is this stimulus? It turns out that you could take a natural, you know, herring gull head, and you could show it to a baby chick, and the chick would peck it. Um, so here's the pecking rate on this uh, y-axis. Then they used a model, which was not an actual head, but looked very similar to it. Baby bird would peck it. Then they'd put a bill only, so not even the rest of the head, just something that looked like the bill with the red dot. Baby bird would still peck it. Then they were like, let's try a different shape. Let's try a stick. It turns out the stick ended up um, it causing them to peck at it the most. So uh, it may not be 100% logical, just like with the stickleback fish, just attacking anything with a red underside. Um, a lot of mammals are able to walk and nurse from their mothers within hours of their birth. So, you know, if you've ever seen videos of a baby cow or a baby giraffe or a baby horse, they get up fairly quickly and then they'll go and they'll nurse from their moms. Even baby humans have an innate suckling response to nurse from their moms. So if there is, if you, you know, see a baby, make sure your hands are clean and you basically put your finger in their mouth and kind of rub up on the uh on the basically on the upper part of their mouth on the roof of their mouth they will instinctively start suckling like as if they're nursing that's why you can put like a bottle in a baby's mouth and the baby will instinctively start suckling to get milk and that's necessary because without that the the baby will not get nourishment or at least it wouldn't before you know modern day things um there are some learned behaviors like this one, behavioral imprinting, that have to happen within certain time frames. Um, and if they don't happen, then they're not going to happen. So, for example, um, this guy was really famous. His name was Conrad Lorenz. And he did a lot of experiments with geese. And some of the experiments that he did basically were imprinting on baby geese. So he would end up, I don't know how he figured this out. Um, it's been a while since I've studied him, but he basically eventually came to the point where he realized the first thing that moves that a gosling or even a duckling sees once it is hatched from its egg, it identifies as its mother. So he actually had multiple groups or multiple broods of goslings that he let hatch and he was the first thing they saw that moved. So they imprinted on him as his mother. I mean, as their mother. They followed him around everywhere. He even had to go up in a small plane so he could teach them how to fly. However, if within a certain time the, the goslings or ducklings were not exposed to something that they could imprint on, then they wouldn't imprint. So there was this what he called a critical period or a critical window during which this imprinting had to happen. And it didn't even have to be a, an actual person or a living organism. So for example, one experiment they did, they used an inanimate duck, just a little duck toy, and that poor little duckling has imprinted on that and thinks it's his or her mama. There are some other behaviors like that. For example, uh, there's some evidence that human language is like that. If you don't learn it within the first like five years of life, if you're not exposed to, to speech and human language, you may not be able to acquire it. Um, that is actually something very similar to songbirds. So a lot of songbirds may have an innate capacity to uh, sing, but they have to learn their particular species song from an, an adult of their species. If they don't learn that song within a certain period, or if they learn the wrong song within that critical period, that is not a behavior that will be able to, to be um, to be able to be corrected. They will never sing their actual species song. They will just sing what they learned. All right, then you have another number of other learned behaviors that contribute to reproductive success or even innate behaviors. There are a lot of courtship and mating behaviors. So here we see, oh man, I forgot what this guy is. A frigate bird, I believe. Um, and that nice, puffy, weird, uh, kidney-shaped thing on the front of its neck is apparently dead sexy to the females. Uh, here we see a massive flamingo courtship display. Uh, and it's just like hundreds of flamingos just kind of walking in a circle, dancing like that, and then they'll pair off and then go off to mate and raise some chicks. Um, here we see 
a lizard with the, this kind of skin flap. Um, that's an anole, and it basically displays, displays that skin flap. Um, there's probably specific courting behavior with it, and uh, if it is uh, attractive to the female, then the female will choose to mate with it. Um, but these are signals that have to happen in a specific way if the courtship display is not correct or if it's not good enough for the opposite gender, then it will be unsuccessful and that will decrease the reproductive fitness of that organism. Um, another thing that uh, organisms learn to do is to forage for food. Um, so there's this model called optimal foraging theory that basically can predict how an organism will move around when it's trying to search for food in a way that minimizes the energy that's used while maximizing the amount of food. Um, and so to maximize its fitness, an animal will forage in the way that's going to provide it the most benefit. So you can actually see this when you look at like insects foraging for behavior. Um, they'll take different strategies, but eventually they'll they'll work on a strategy that costs them the least energy and let them get back lets them get back to, you know, the rest of their population or their colony or their hive, um, and uh, exploit the resource as efficiently as possible. So uh, a lot of cooperative behaviors can increase the fitness of an individual. Um, and so there's something that are selected for. So for example, pack behavior. Here we see a pack of wolves hunting a bison. Sorry, bison. Um, but uh, what you have is, you know, uh, wolves and canine species tend to operate in what we call packs, uh, though not all of them do. In some species, there will only be one breeding pair, which is the alpha pair, which is a male and a female. Um, and those are the the alpha pair usually have to prove themselves in dominance, maybe by fighting or dominance displays, which could indicate their fitness if they're able to fight off uh, the other uh, wolves in the pack. Um, and so since they are the only pair that breeds, then all the resources go to what would presumably be um, the offspring of several extremely fit parents. Um, then you can also have division of labor. So in some packs, what will happen is you'll have a member of the pack who stays with the young, the offspring, the pups that are not old enough to hunt uh, while the others hunt and they'll bring back some food for this, this pack member when they bring back food for the pups. So that way they know their pups are safe, but they're still able to feed everyone. And then um, wolves especially are very good at cooperating to bring down much larger prey than they would be able to do uh, in any way when they're by themselves. Um, similar to the way that like, you know, lionesses and a pride would attack together. Uh, and they will usually very firmly define and mark their territory, often with urine or with feces. Uh, there are cooperative behaviors in other types of animals as well. So herds, flocks, and schools are different types of um, kind of cooperative groups that animals can live in. Uh, basically, when um, organisms or animals have this strategy, they'll coordinate and communicate with each other to move in larger groups and move together. Uh, this provides a lot of advantages, so they can better defend against predators when there's many of them together. Um, and then more eyes on the lookout for predators mean a greater chance of sighting a predator before it can attack and decreasing the chance that any one individual will get eaten. Um, they can uh, have better luck foraging for food because there are more of them to search for food. Since they're all in a group with their same species, it can increase the uh, success rate of them finding a mate. And then uh, for schooling fish or flocking birds, they can actually, the, 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 their arrangement when they swim or when they fly can actually help them conserve energy by making them more aerodynamic or making them more hydrodynamic. Uh, just the same way that uh, birds will fly in a V formation. Um, and that actually is not, uh, it's actually so they can take advantage of basically the, the air that's being moved by their predecessor to help them move a little easier with less energy.
So here we have several examples. Here we have a school of fish. In fish, when they're gathering in groups, it's usually shoaling or schooling. A school of fish is all one species. Uh, flocks of birds tend to be also single species. This is, um, flocks of birds are also called murmurations, which is interesting to me. And this is a murmuration of starlings, which can be like hundreds of thousands of birds just flying in one giant group. And here we see a herd of mammals. This is specifically a herd of caribou. And each of these little things that look kind of like rice grains or something, those are each individual caribous. They can travel in massive herds. You can see why a predator would not want to approach that giant herd of caribou. Um, and then uh, you, not only vertebrates uh, do this kind of grouping, you also have what's called swarming behavior, um, where you can have like groups of in this case, insects uh, that will travel together. So what you see in this picture is a swarm of bees that have attached themselves to a tree limb. They are scouting for a new place to create a hive. And if they find a good place to create a hive, they will form a colony. So these are highly organized social structures of insects. Um, and they are very well coordinated. They can perform these really complex tasks that an individual insect would not be able to do, such as building an anthill, building a termite mound, building a beehive, making honey. Um, and then a lot of these behaviors are regulated by pheromones. So bees and ants would probably be the most typical examples, though you also have other organisms like wasps as well. Uh, we already talked about predator warning and a posomatic uh, coloration. Here we see a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies specifically eat a plant that makes them taste absolutely disgusting to predators. So that warning coloring lets any predator know, I will taste nasty and you will throw up if you eat me. And then there's a final strategy called kin selection. So what ends up happening is your reproductive success is not just based on how many organisms you produced, it's how many of your genes get passed on to the next generation. But the thing is, you have organisms with whom you share genes, uh, your family members, for example. So even if you don't have reproductive success directly, you could still help your, your uh, genes get passed on to the next generation by helping out your relatives. So it's like, uh, I'm going to sacrifice my reproductive success to increase yours, but that's still indirectly increasing my reproductive success because we share genes. So if your genes get passed on, it's kind of like my genes getting passed on too. The really big example of this is in some of these colonial insects like bees, for example, only the queen bee reproduces. Um, and the female drones who do all the work because the male drones are only there to reproduce with the queen. The female dr drones do all the work. So if you see a bumblebee floating around gathering pollen and stuff, those are all females. Um, and they're all either going to be sisters or, um, you know, they're going to be very closely related. And they're also very closely related to the queen usually. Um, so drones are not reproductive. They're sterile. Uh, and that's usually caused by a uh, mix of pheromones that the queen's releasing. Uh, so she doesn't have competition for her offspring. Um, and so the drones have no reproductive success of their own because they are sterile. They will not reproduce. But they work to increase the survival of the entire hive. And female drones actually have some genetic quirks which make them share about 75% of their genes with each other rather than human siblings who only share about 50% of their genes with each other. So if they can increase the survival or fitness of their queen and her offspring, they can ensure that their genes get passed on. So I have another example for you. So say you have this chick. Uh, she's got a couple of traits, blue eyes and red hair. Her brother has the same traits, blue eyes and red hair. Uh, he happens to have children with his baby mama, wife, whatever, who has blonde hair and brown eyes. But let's say that the, the red-haired chick, let's call her Emma for some reason, I don't know why. So Emma, for one reason or another, has no children. But if she decided she could move in to her brother's house and help with their babies, and if she does that, she can help ensure that more of his babies survive. And if more of his babies survive, they share genetics with her. So in a way, she is helping her own genes get passed on. 
So all their money, all the resources, all the time, all of that, that she would have spent on her own offspring, uh, she can kind of pool all of those with her brother and his baby mama, and they can raise more of these offspring that have the same traits as her and her brother. So that's kin selection. I I'm going to help you out because you share my genes. You just make sure you're passing on some of my genes too. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get in your way. I'm not going to, you know, produce more babies to compete with you. So that is it. Next up, we're going to talk about energy and how it flows through ecosystems. Hopefully this one will be a little faster coming. All right. See you guys in class.